All right, thank you, Stan, and thank you to the Georgia AAP for inviting me to speak on this fascinating uh, and evolving condition. Let's just make sure these work, okay. So just a few disclosures before I begin, one of which is, just as Stan said, I am the, uh, have the privilege of being the medical director of the Southeast Eosinophilic Disease Center of Atlanta, which is a nonprofit multidisciplinary center for children and adults with eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease. We're just a bit off on the uh, picture, sorry about that. Um, so let's begin with a case report of Owen, who is a five-year-old male with a history of eczema and asthma, and he presents with a six-month history of progressive coughing, gagging, and sneezing when he eats solid foods. His dad brought in this video of him eating, of course, at Chick-fil-A. You can see him excessively chewing, reaching for something to drink to wash it down. He starts to cough, gag, and then he sneezes. So with these unusual behaviors, he was placed empirically on proton pump inhibitor therapy at a dose of one milligram per kilogram per dose twice a day, but returns two months later with continued feeding difficulties and poor weight gain. So he subsequently undergoes an upper endoscopy with biopsies. And this is what we find, if you can see the pictures. In his proximal or upper esophagus, he had this ringed-like appearance that goes down the length of his esophagus uh, that we call tracheolization because it looks like you're in the trachea, which, by the way, is not the place that the gastroenterologist ever wants to find himself. <laughs> he also had these lines that go down the length of his esophagus that we call linear furrows, and both of these features are consistent with esophagitis or thickening of the esophagus. In his distal or lower esophagus, he had these white plaques that we previously thought were specific for candida esophagitis, but now we know that they may be suggestive of something different. And just to compare, this is what his esophagus should have looked like. So no surprise, based on the title of this talk, his biopsies returned consistent with the diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis with this dense accumulation of eosinophils that stain red with eosin. He had more than 50 eos per high power field, and so with a new diagnosis of EOE, he was begun on therapy, uh, and we will return to him at the end of the talk. Now, I was asked to give a talk on the dietary therapy of EOE, but before we get to that, I wanted to take you on a quick whirlwind tour of EOE in general. The story of EOE begins uh, in Nebraska in 1993, with a case series of 12 adults who had unusually large numbers of esophageal eosinophils. And Dr. Atwood and colleagues compared these patients to those with known gastroesophageal reflux disease and demonstrated distinct differences between these two groups. Then two years later at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Kelly and Sampson studied 10 children uh, who were thought to have poorly controlled gastroesophageal reflux disease. In fact, six of those 10 had already undergone Nissen fund applications and they were also found to have unusually large numbers of esophageal eosinophils, uh, and they uh, demonstrated that nearly all of them had clinical and histologic improvement when food was taken away and they were fed exclusively with an amino acid-based formula for six weeks. So this was the seminal study that established EOE as a distinct clinical entity uh, in children, something different than gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, and provided firm evidence that esophageal inflammation results from food antigen exposure. Because these are children that live in the same homes with the same grasses, the same danders inside, uh, but when you take away food, their disease goes quiet. Over the past 20 years, the support for an allergic etiology to EOE has greatly expanded, as we now know that up to 70% of patients with EOE have other atopic manifestations. Most patients have evidence of food or aeroallergen hypersensitivity, as defined by prick or patch testing. There is strong evidence of a Th2-type immune response in patients with EOE, and there's an experimental model of EOE that can be induced in mice by food allergen exposure. So where in the immunologic spectrum does EOE fall? Dr. Garza had mentioned that there are, in simplistic terms, two types of allergy. Um, with your IgE-mediated allergies being the more acute and anaphylactic allergies, 
and the cell-mediated allergies, your more indolent and delayed allergies that often manifest in the gastrointestinal system. We believe that EOE falls somewhere in the middle, bridging both IgE and cell-mediated mechanisms and acting a lot like eczema and asthma. And as of 2012, EOE is now defined as a chronic immune-mediated esophageal disease characterized clinically by symptoms of esophageal dysfunction and histologically with an eosinophil predominant esophagitis, in particular with more than 15 eosinophils per high power field. But what's so important is that we exclude all other gastrointestinal disorders uh, that can cause esophageal eosinophilia before we make a formal diagnosis of EOE. And the most common mimicker of EOE is gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, okay, so for those patients that present to the clinic with suspected EOE, we place them empirically on proton pump inhibitor therapy for four to eight weeks. If they do not improve with this therapy, they subsequently undergo an upper endoscopy. Um, and if their biopsies reveal more than 15 EOs per high power field, they have a diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis. For those patients who cannot wait because they present with a stricture or a food impaction, it is recommended that they subsequently undergo reflux monitoring and if this reflux monitoring returns abnormal and they have more than 15 EOs per high power field, they also are given a diagnosis of EOE. From an epidemiologic standpoint, since its inception, we have seen a steady rise in the incidence and prevalence of EOE. Um, here you can see from this single center study in Philadelphia that in 1996 at CHOP, they diagnosed five patients with this disease. And 10 years later, by 2006, they diagnosed over 120 patients. And this rise seemed to be irrespective of whether these were tertiary referrals uh, or local referrals from their region. This rise, of course, raises the ubiquitous question of all allergy and immunologic diseases, which is, are we truly seeing a rise in this disease? Is this the emergence of an absolutely brand new disease? Um, or are we simply looking harder for it? And maybe it has to do with access to care. Nationally, the incidence of EOE is reported to be as high as 10 new patients per 100,000 people per year, with a prevalence of 55 per 100,000 people, equating to approximately one in 2,000 people living with this condition. Just to compare to inflammatory bowel disease, you can see that we are diagnosing more new patients with EOE than with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease combined. Uh, but, of course, the prevalence of IBD remains higher, given that it's been around for so much longer. At our center last year, we diagnosed 110 new patients uh, with this condition. And on a background of 10,000 new patients per year, EOE was diagnosed in approximately one in every 100 new patient visits to our office. And currently, amongst the 14 of us, we currently follow over uh, 600 patients with this disease. So who actually gets EOE? Well, we know that this is a condition predominantly of Caucasian males who are of middle to high socioeconomic status. This, of course, also raises lots of questions. Why Caucasian males? Why middle to high socioeconomic status? Um, is this a true epiphenomenon, or does this also have to do with access to care? We know that up to 70% of patients are atopic. 60% have a family history of ATP. 10% have a family history of esophageal strictures, and 8% have a family history of biopsy-proven EOE. And these bottom numbers, the family history is sure to rise as we educate our adult colleagues to take biopsies uh, when they are dilating for what they think is a Schatzky's ring uh, or a reflux stricture, because they may actually have EOE. Interestingly, there appears to be an age-dependent continuum with respect to the presenting features of EOE, as you can see that our youngest patients often present with feeding difficulties or failure to thrive. The school-age kids often present with vomiting or abdominal pain. And the older teenagers and young adults often present with dysphagia and food impaction. We believe that this occurs uh, as the disease um, changes from an inflammatory disease to a more fibrotic disease over time, much like we think of inflammatory bowel disease. So what's the role of the allergist in this disease? Well, upon referring to an allergist, the goals uh, of this consultation are twofold. 
uh, which is to identify the foods that may be triggering a patient's esophageal eosinophilia, and to identify the presence of any comorbid IgE-mediated food allergies, as we know that up to 20% of patients with EOE have food allergies, as opposed to 4% in the general population. And given that EOE uh, bridges both IgE and cell-mediated mechanisms, it's recommended that patients undergo both skin prick and patch testing. But what we're learning is that these tests are not perfect in finding a patient's trigger foods. Uh, in fact, the positive predictive value and negative predictive values of these tests can be as low as 40%. So there's plenty of false positives and false negatives with the skin prick and patch tests. But despite these challenges, we know that reproducibly the most common causative foods in EOE are milk, soy, egg, and wheat, with milk being the most common, if you can see on the edge, uh, up to 74% of patients reacted to milk uh, in Dr. Kagawala's reintroduction study out of Chicago. What makes it even more challenging to find a patient's food triggers is that not all patients react to just one single food. Uh, this study from Philadelphia showed that only 40% of patients uh, had a single food trigger, whereas 60% of patients have more than one food causing their EOE. So that makes it often feel a lot like we're playing the game Mastermind when we're trying to find the right combination of food triggers for those of you that remember this game. Uh, is it milk, soy, wheat that's causing a patient's EOE, uh, or is it egg, nuts, fish? But ultimately, the treatment of EOE hinges on this allergy testing. The allergists love this slide, by the way. Uh, because if a food or foods can be identified, um, then the most logical treatment course would be the targeted elimination diet, taking away those foods that a patient tests positive to. If foods cannot be identified or an allergist is not available, the options include topical corticosteroid therapy or empiric elimination diets, uh, taking away the most common causative foods. And the goals of treating EOE are relieving symptoms, eradication of esophageal eosinophils, and reversal of inflammatory changes, and prevention of long-term complications, in particular strictures and food impactions, uh, one of which is shown here. And just before we get to dietary management of EOE, I'd be remiss not to mention the two most commonly prescribed topical corticosteroid therapies, including fluticasone and oral viscous budesonide. The concept of these medications are to coat the esophagus as you swallow them, treating locally the inflammation. And the efficacy of these medications range anywhere from 50% to 90%, depending upon the study outcome that was used. And while we know that corticosteroids are very uh, useful in this disease, in fact, here 93% achieving clinical and histologic remission with oral solumedrol, the problem comes with discontinuation as nearly all patients will have histologic recurrence when these medications are stopped. And you can see that eosinophil counts uh, can, incre whoops, can increase up to uh, pretreatment levels when steroids are stopped. So there are some disadvantages of steroid therapy, and one of which is that treatment must be indefinite, um, and absolute compliance is important. Uh, there are potential side effects that can be a concern, including a 7 to 10 percent chance of oral or esophageal candidiasis, um, and we're always watching for growth suppression. Um, but most importantly, when patients are on topical corticosteroids, it's almost impossible to identify a patient's causative food allergen. So patients often find themselves indefinitely on these steroids without really knowing what's the root of their disease. So that finally leads us to the title of this talk, which is the dietary management uh, of EOE. And this includes the targeted elimination diet, excluding those food proteins that a patient tests positive for, empiric elimination diets, one of which is the six food elimination diet, uh, eliminating the most common causative foods, and finally the elemental diet, eliminating all intact proteins and substituting with an amino acid based formula. The diet that makes the most conceptual sense is the targeted elimination diet, uh, excluding those foods that a patient tests positive for on skin prick or patch tests. This was studied in a retrospective analysis at CHOP amongst 319 patients over an 11-year period, 
Um, and Dr. Spurgle uh, fed these patients a diet based on the results of skin prick and patch tests for 23 different foods. Uh, and he found that 53% had normalization of their esophageal biopsies with less than 15 eosinophils per high power field. What was even more interesting was that when milk was eliminated empirically along with this targeted elimination diet, the success rate increased to 77%. And this is a testament to the low negative predictive value of milk uh, because these are patients who tested negative for milk but if you empirically take milk away with the foods that a patient tests positive for, uh, the success rate increases by 24 points. In a recent meta-analysis, the pooled efficacy of the targeted elimination diet alone was 45% in inducing remission with less than 15 eosinophils per high power field. So roughly 50% of the patients on this diet uh, will induce into remission. When foods are not uh, identified by the allergist or an allergist is not available, another option is the six food elimination diet, uh, which empirically eliminates the six most common causative foods, which include milk, soy, egg, wheat, nuts, and seafood, typically for a six to eight week period of time, followed by sequential reintroductions of these foods, coupled with endoscopies to evaluate for histologic recurrence. During my fellowship, this was studied by Dr. Kagawala, and he found uh, that when all six foods were eliminated, 97% of patients showed clinical improvement and 74% demonstrated histologic improvement. But the problem with this diet, of course, is that it obligates a patient to multiple endoscopies uh, because we are still reliant upon these endoscopies and biopsies to know if a patient's EOE has recurred. Uh, we're all eagerly awaiting uh, the arrival of some non-invasive markers of disease. There's a few that are in the pipeline, and we're hoping that a few will be um, available to us within the next couple of years. And we're also enrolling in a four-food elimination diet study currently at our center, um, which if it's found to be as effective as the six-food elimination diet, uh, it will reduce the number of endoscopies by two. This is just a sample menu. Uh, for those patients for the first six to eight weeks when they're on uh, the six food elimination diet, they're allowed to eat meat, potatoes, uh, fruits, vegetables, legumes, and rice. So they have to be creative in how to combine these foods and still make it fun. It is doable, um, but it is highly restrictive for those first six to eight weeks. And then when the foods are sequentially reintroduced, the diet is liberalized. In that same meta-analysis, you can see that the pooled efficacy of the six-food elimination diet is 72% in inducing remission as opposed to, again, the 45% with targeted therapy. And because milk is such a common causative food in this disease, it's not surprising that there's been some enthusiasm for an empiric milk elimination diet. Um, this was uh, first studied by the Chicago group in a retrospective analysis amongst their youngest of patients, and they showed a surprising and impressive 65% response, though only amongst 17 patients. However, a second study uh, from Philadelphia showed much more modest results with only 30% of patients responding to the milk elimination diet. Um, so the response rate probably falls somewhere in between with maybe 30 to 65% of patients responding uh, to an empiric milk elimination diet, and it is probably uh, most effective in our youngest of children. When all else fails, we have the elemental diet, uh, which completely eliminates all intact proteins and supplements with an amino acid-based formula. And just like Dr. Kelly's initial report, it's been shown reproducibly uh, that nearly all patients on this diet will achieve clinical and histologic remission. The problem with this diet, of course, is that it often and almost always requires an NG or a G-tube to administer, so we reserve this diet for our most severe and refractory patients. But as you can see from the meta-analysis, this is certainly our most effective treatment in EOE with a pooled efficacy of 90% as opposed to the targeted therapy of 45% and the six food elimination diet is 72%. So there are plenty of challenges as well with dietary therapy. 
uh, one of which is the compliance with the diet. Uh, the cost of the formulas, particularly if they're not given through a tube, insurance companies typically do not cover that. The palatability of the formula, uh, acquired food or texture aversion, the need for NG tubes or G tubes, uh, potential problems with quality of life requiring psychological support, uh, and the potential for nutritional deficiencies requiring dietitian support. And this is just a listing of the variety of nutritional deficiencies that can occur with each individual food as it's eliminated, highlighting the need for a dietitian to be part of the team when we're treating with dietary therapy. So whatever happened to our friend Owen? Well, like many others, he returned with negative skin prick and patch tests. And after failing topical steroids with persistent esophageal eosinophilia, he was begun on the six food elimination diet. And through that series of sequential reintroductions, it was found that milk and wheat were his causative foods. And currently, with the exclusion of milk and wheat, he remains asymptomatic with only five eosinophils per high power field in his most recent endoscopy. So in summary, EOE is uh, certainly an increasingly common disease. There is strong support for an allergic etiology. Uh, topical steroid therapy is certainly effective, but must be given indefinitely. Dietary modification is also an effective treatment and may allow for prolonged drug-free remission. Uh, in this disease, certainly treatment must be patient and family-centered, uh, and we certainly need more, uh, particularly prospective research uh, in this disease. And with that, I thank you all for your time, and I will now take questions. <laughs>